So that's what we did. We proposed this to uh, our American friends who were making vaccines. And uh, after a few years of discussion, it was actually we made a little bit of a compromise. It can be said that uh, they thought it was too uh, innovative to uh, and to do it like this. So it, it was done that it was an ordinary uh, randomized clinical trial with the HPV vaccine. Uh, but uh, we we kept that we would both be uh, following the patient in registries during and after the trial. Uh, and uh, as a result of this, the whole phase three uh, vaccination program was uh, to a majority of all data collection being done in Sweden and our neighboring Nordic, Nordic countries. Uh, and uh, uh, when the this was, uh, uh, was first approved in 2006, it was approved even with protection against invasive cancer on the label of the vaccines. But this was then uh, uh, after the FDA that issued this had looked and seen that we had a very stringent protocol for long term follow up of the vaccinated cohorts that would follow them all the way until they, uh, they uh, would develop cancer. Actually, uh, we, we were able to uh, demonstrate this in 2018, 12 years later. Uh, that we uh, among the participants in the vaccination trials that it had protected against invasive cancer. The second step uh, uh, that was also uh, uh, part of the original plan was real world data collection. That is, uh, everyone who takes the vaccine in, in the uh, ordinary vaccination program is entered into a cohort that's followed for, uh, uh, for late effects such as invasive cancer. Uh, we, this uh, we were able to uh, show in 2020 that the HPV vaccination had uh, protected against invasive cancer also uh, in real life in the entire human uh, uh, population of Sweden. Uh, we were actually the first to uh, publish this, even though other countries started vaccinating before us. And also other countries have registries, but we knew exactly what to do. It was part of a <laughs> collaboration. So we were all set once we had the, uh, the data was coming in. So uh, vi this was definitely uh, uh, something that was helping us so far. The next step now that we have the vaccines and we have effective tools for screening is to go further to uh, complete elimination of the cervical cancer and the human papillomavirus. The WHO has already set this as a prioritized goal for global elimination of the cervical cancer and HPV in consensus in 2020. And, uh, uh, what we are doing there is a uh, campaign-based multi-adult women uh, cohort vaccination program where we are offering the uh, uh, vaccines to mid-adult women together with a screening for HPV, uh, meaning that if they are both protected against the infection and they are also negative, they simply won't get this disease and we, we can then provide this protection to the mid-adult women as well. Uh, so uh, uh, with this, I think uh, that we, we are launching this exactly as a registry-based trial. All the women are consented and we are then following them up with real-world data. We know exactly how many HPV tests are taken in Sweden. It's 772,000 HPV tests each year. We don't need to uh, bring the women in to take new tests. We consent them that we will ask for the test results. So uh, in this way, we, we can uh, enroll this very large cohort of uh, women all over Sweden with concomitant vaccination and screening and follow them up using the real world data to see are we really eliminating the HPV infection from Sweden? All the data so far suggests that uh, this is indeed the case. I think that the uh, 
outlook for HPV is is very uh, very bad. It, it's uh <laughs> it's not likely to survive very much longer. And I think it's a real world data that has really enabled us to come this far. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> And just before the short break, we listen also to Mr. Ravinder Dharma, um, Davan. Uh, he's the Vice President and Head of Center of Observational Research, or CORE as we know it. Please. Well, uh, Honorable Ambassador and my fellow panelists here and speakers and my colleagues here, it's my pleasure to be here today and, and thanks for the opportunity to not only just recognize but celebrate the collaboration here uh, with all of you. Um, you know, I come from the world of real-world data and, and real-world evidence in the last 30 years that I've spent in the industry and in my academic career, uh, I started uh, um, a long time ago. <clears throat> when you think about it, the healthcare data and the real-world data is permeating in every aspect of our health ecosystem. And it's coming to us now in so many different shapes and forms. It's, as you pointed out, Bjorn, earlier, that it's coming to us from the electronic health records, the claims data set, the wearables, the images, the biomarkers, and all of that information that is coming together and giving us that enormous, enormous insights into what we see not only from the clinical standpoint, but also from the real world standpoint, how the patients are actually experiencing the innovation that we are bringing to the market and how we can drive some of those insights back into the clinical programs that we are embarking upon for the future. So enormous, um, uh, opportunity for us to work together on that. And I can start to take a step back and say what else, what other place in the world where we can find an infrastructure like Sweden? It's, it's such a pleasure to sort of think about that. You know, we had 60 years of data collection and you know, at an individual patient level um, that we've been able to establish here in Sweden and numerous registries that allows us to sort of link the data uh, and provide us those insights. When we think about it, you know, what are the key elements of those um, for the real world data and real world evidence? The completeness of the data, the comprehensiveness of the data, the quality of the data, the linkages that we can establish. And when we start thinking about our collaboration in 2016, it sort of encouraged us to look at that infrastructure that already existed in Sweden. And although we embark upon um, from MSD standpoint, I must admit, I don't know how many people here know about CORE, what CORE stands for. And CORE is a center for observation and real world evidence. And so from MSD standpoint, we are immensely committed to sort of generate the real world data and real world evidence throughout the globe. And particularly here in Sweden, just given the fact that uh, such a wonderful uh, infrastructure that existed. So when we embarked upon our collaboration in 2016, it gave us immense pleasure to work with the Institute and share our research thoughts and research ideas. And that's the foundation of our collaboration here. And how can we sort of identify those gaps and research ideas that allows us to work together? Coming of the minds together, we've got a pretty elaborate research community within MSD, which works with the, the Karolinska Institute to sort of sit together and figure out in different therapeutic areas, in different areas, what are the key research questions that we can collaboratively work on? And that's the foundational work that we do. We not only just think about uh, the, the data itself, but how can we enhance on methodology? How can we en enhance on um, the methods that we have deploy to dig into the data and develop those insights that allow us to not only improve the patient lives, but also from a public health standpoint, the insight that we can bring back. <clears throat> it gives us enormous pleasure that we now have a 10 year of commitment um, that we just completed five years. In the next five years, uh, we're gonna be embarking upon another set of brilliant ideas. We're already sort of working, as uh, Dr. Orison pointed out, 10 different projects we completed. But when I look at that yesterday, we were talking about uh, 23 projects that we have embarked upon. We got enormous set of publications that have come out. The uh, publication that Dr. Dilma talked about was already in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's very prestigious work that was done. So we're gonna continue to build upon that in the next five years and see where we can take this. Um, <clears throat> the power of the real world data and the real world evidence and 
I know we talked about earlier, but it's, it's becoming a new currency, right? So how we can utilize all the work that we can do collectively and develop those insights that we can take back into our drug development allows us to sort of embark upon the next set of um, innovation that we're going to be working on. So from that standpoint, I'm, I'm here to sort of celebrate that and thank you for the opportunity and I'm looking forward to our collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we will have a very short break, but don't wander off because it's, it's very short. We need to be here and start the broadcast again at, at 9.20 sharp. So if you need some water or a coffee or something else, just go and grab it and get back here again. And then we will have a panel discussion and see where we can get that. So thank you for this.
Harvey, do you have our guest online? Ah. So I think we're on time. So welcome back to this broadcast. And um, as we have discussed, uh, we will go into a panel discussion now. And as you can see, we have a, a very distinguished panel with people. Uh, first, the speakers that we already heard. And then we have added a few people with some extra competence here. So the people we have added, just to mention them, is, is Ms. Jenny Nolborg. She's the national coordinator and director of the Office of Life Science at the government's Office of Sweden. Then we also have Mr. Andreas Hager. Over here, uh, he's the founder of Upstream Dream Incorporated. And we also added uh, Ms. Sofia Svantsson, she's the co-founder and CEO of Elsa Science. And as you can see online also, we're very pleased to have Kaisa Immonen, she's the director of policy for European Patient Forum as well. So, uh, I would like to start this by, by actually giving the word to you, Jenny. Uh, uh, after what you heard from the five speakers, uh, what do, you, what do you see that is in already in line with the work you do at the Life Science Office? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Björn, and thank you all for orchestrating this fantastic uh, morning on a, such an important topic. It's uh, as my role as national coordinator, civil servants, uh, it's really my role to, to work on the implementation of the uh, national life sciences strategy. And, uh, but also uh, reflect on that the, the input actually from this collaboration was to input to the uh, national strategy as we have it, as so many different inputs, but really the work between uh, the Karolinska Institute and MSD uh, re is, has really been a flagship for Sweden in showcasing how important it is. And I would also like to stress the importance of the really long-term collaborations, really building trust and building new, new opportunities. So that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is uh, the National Life Sciences Strategy is geared towards precision medicine. And we can only accomplish uh, precision medicine if we have a uh, data-driven setup. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, is truly, and, and moving forward, I think that we need to see more and more of these type of collaborations. Even though the strategy is from the government, it's really by the whole sector that, that needs to join forces uh, in the development further. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, I would like also to, to introduce Kaisa. Uh, I hope you can hear me now, and I would like to give you the, the, the stage as well. Uh, you represent the European um, uh, Patient Forum, and, and please uh, tell us a bit more about you and your organization, and also how you work with these kind of questions and topics that we are discussing today. Um, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Um, good morning, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be able to join you even virtually, and I'm sorry not to be able to travel to Stockholm for today, but um, still it's uh, really interesting to be part of this panel. And um, where I come from is at European level, Patients Umbrella Organization, the European Patients Forum. We focus on EU policy. So we really look at this from an EU policy perspective, um, but also with a wider focus on changing practice, healthcare practice and research to be more participatory, so involving patients. Um, we are not a disease specific organization, so we don't work on specific diseases or therapeutic areas, but we represent a very diverse patient community of almost 80 member organizations across the EU. So you can imagine the diversity of uh, experience also within our community and particularly on this topic when it comes to data and digitalization. So obviously one of our biggest priorities right now is the European health data space, the most important legislative piece right now next to the revision, the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Thank you. And thank you for that. Um, I will move on to you, Andreas. Um, you're also new to the panel. Uh, please tell us a bit about, uh, first, I think we we're a bit curious about the um, uh, founder upstre of Upstream uh, Dream Incorporated. And also, I know you have many hats, as we say it, in different organizations and different roles in, in this. So, mm. please. Yeah. Um, well, um, 19 years ago, uh, my first child was born with cystic fibrosis, and uh, and I was at the same time at w was at the Karolinska Institute working uh, as a patient data lawyer around uh, the innovation systems, and uh, 
Um, so I was in this intersection and then I came, I, then I was uh, a caregiver in the health system and saw all possibilities there. So, so that's, that's where my hat started uh, to evolve. Um, and then I was working with the rheumatologists that had these amazing uh, treatments and they were able to really follow the, uh, them up in a, in, in, a, in a way that really changed how, how the treatments were made available to the patients, how, um, how risks were managed and so on. So I learned over many, many years how things like Dr. Dillner here um, the example he gave, I think, is very, very strong, and uh, how those things happen in reality. Uh, so then later on, uh, maybe 12 years or 15 years later, uh, we started the Upstream Dream as a kind of patient's response to, to this whole development, because we need, um, we need also support from, from data and, and uh, knowledge management uh, in our everyday life, uh, taking care of ourselves, uh, working together with healthcare, supporting researchers, um, and uh, actually, right now in cystic fibrosis, we are in a situation where there is a there is a, a revolutionary treatment available. We see how it changes lives. I just came back from the U.S. where it's available, uh, and it's been for three years. And uh, um, but here in Sweden, we don't have it. Uh, so I'm experiencing from all different <laughs> perspectives uh, what we're talking about here. Mm. Uh, so, so that's uh, background and my hats. Perfect. <laughs> you have many important perspectives then. So yeah, you. And, uh, hmm. yeah. And I would like to introduce as well then Sofia Svantesson from Elsa Science. Uh, please tell us a bit about Elsa and what you're doing. Yes, we are building a service for rheumatic care management, which means that we have one tool towards the patients, which is um, a tool for self-care and self-monitoring. And there is a clinical decision support within uh, the clinics for the healthcare providers where they can monitor their patients from, from a distance. And I, I'm here today a little bit to challenge the concept real-world data, real-world evidence. Uh, at Elsa Science, we work with real-life data and real life evidence and already now I can extract an anonymous user and see how they've been using for example a jack inhibitor for a month nothing happens to the pain nothing happens to the fatigue they switch to a TNF inhibitor uh, with infusion and pain is decreasing drastically um, we see that kind of data, we have that kind of data. Uh, you might expect it's the other way around, that the TNF inhibitor maybe shouldn't have a, an, an effect and you go to the JAK inhibitor. In this case, it's different. This is an individual that might have a different pattern than the groups uh, or the general knowledge maybe among, among clinicians. And I wonder, when we have 50,000 patients uh, with the same diagnosis, uh, can we afford to disregard from patients' real-life evidence, patient-reported outcomes? Uh, can we afford to not utilize that in life science and healthcare? There is a perfect storm approaching in rheumatology in the United States. In five years, we will lack 5,000 rheumatologists. We need to have um, re rely on the patients themselves. Um, you mentioned here, Jenny, long-term relationships and trust. We need long-term relationships and trust with the patients. We need to trust the fact that they know their disease, they know their life. The patient reported outcomes as, is as valuable as the real world data that we refer to here today. So uh, I'd really like to challenge everyone on that perspective and how can we build trust between the patients and the clinicians and the whole ecosystem. Um, because I think there's very, very, very few pa patients would report just to get a different drug. I don't really believe in that. We shouldn't be afraid of, of trusting the patients and bringing them into this community uh, and making them have a very big uh, role in this. Thank you. I like, I like the energy you, you provide to this panel, so uh, it's <laughs> perfect. So now we heard all the different perspectives, uh, and we also know that you have a lot of perspectives in the audience, and you're a very competent audience, so please also, if you want to, to join the discussion, please raise your hand, and I will try to, to, 
see you and, and give you the word uh, later on. And it's the same thing for the panel now. We will try to make sure that everybody is heard in a good way and that we can make the best of all the different perspectives that we have. And I would like to start with a question. What, uh, what do we see are the main barriers today of using real-world evidence for improved health outcomes and informed decision-making? Um, I'll start with you, Joachim. Um, have you experienced anything in particular in the project with HP, HPV? Uh, it's uh, uh, actually uh, when the rules are stable, it is not really so difficult. After a while you realize uh, uh, how to deal with different things. It is more problematic when there are new rules. Uh, for example, if uh, uh, a specific example is uh, uh, that the rules on data transfer within the European Union are straightforward, but the rules on data transfer to the United States keep changing. Uh, so if there is anything that would really help us to uh, collaborate with the United States is that it would be clear that the rules for data transfer is the same as within the European Union. Mm. I know that you, uh, Professor, also say that there's a lot of opportunities that we can use that we don't use today, uh, and you've experienced it in the project. Um, do you see that everybody is complaining that, that it's so difficult to do this kind of analysis? Is the legislation actually, is it working for us to do this, or do we need to change it? I, I, I think that uh, actually the example that I just gave uh, is that uh, some of these very important uh, public health advances were possible already 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, that uh, even though uh, improvements could be made, it's mostly a matter of building long-term relationships and competence on how to, uh, how to extract and exploit the data in a way that really be benefits the public. Thank you. Yeah, if I may just yes, add to please. that, I think the when you think about the real world data and real world evidence, the acceptance of that, um, there is there are areas where there's tremendous amount of uh, value and acceptance. You know, when you are looking at understanding the epidemiology of the disease, when you're uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, what's the burden of disease, how it impacts patients in the real world. So from that standpoint, in developing guidelines and all that in decision making it could be enormously helpful where we struggle a little bit no, of course is um the area of regulatory uh, acceptance and you know and and also with the peer community you know that's where the the quality of the data matters the completeness of the data and how the connectivity of the data and that's what i touched upon earlier that you know where we can get all of that in one go where we can get the um biomarker data, for example, the imaging data, the, the electronic health records data, for example, of the cancer patients, if we can bring it all together in one place and, and raise the quality of the data, then you will see more acceptance even with the regulatory and the payer community. But until that happens, uh, we're going to continue to struggle a bit, but, but there are so many other uses and decision making where there's already enormous amount of examples that uh, the acceptance of the data. Perfect, thanks. I can see, uh, Professor, uh, <coughs> you're taking a lot of notes here. Uh, what you would like to add to this? Yes, I was struck by what was said from the field of rheumatology, and you are so absolutely right. Uh, the rhetoric here is important. Uh, what we see now is a possibility for patient ownership, that the patients can feel that they own their own disease. And that has everything to do with rhetoric. So I completely agree, real life evidence couples data much more closely to the individual patient than real world data. So that's uh, important. But there is another issue which I think is uh, extremely important in the discussion to follow. And that is that there are two moral imperatives in this field. One moral imperative, obviously, is uh, to safeguard the data, data protection, the integrity of the patient. That's important. But what we tend to forget is that we have to balance this moral imperative with the moral imperative to really use the data for the benefit of the patient in research, in development, in project like the one that Joachim Dillner told us about. So the, polit the political decision makers should always see these two 
moral imperatives in parallel and see to it that they are balanced. We have so many authorities that take care of the first moral imperative, to safeguard data, even in Sweden. But there are very few authorities that really look to the other moral imperative to ensure that data are being used to and for the benefit of the individual patient. We have to balance this much better than we do today. Great, thanks. So I'm also learning the signals from the panel now. I'm I think I'm, I'm tuning in. And I, I know that Jenny <laughs> first, and then we will go to, to uh, Dr. Fjestad, and then we have a, a question from the audience or a comment. So please, Jenny. Yes, I, I think that, and that has been already elaborated on, uh, the, the barriers, the, the, the trick that we have to balance is that uh, we need to know what the true barriers are. That is difficult. The inquiry that is now ongoing uh, will s sort out some really important factors. So now I think it's, or it's very much up to the system to adapt to the new culture that is really needed on the trust base. And it's, it's not only on uh, security, versus uh, uh, data sharing. It's also on uh, uh, knowing what, what data is right to use at the right, right time. So I think that, that that culture base is a barrier. But I also think that the, uh, the, the infrastructure and the ability to federate uh, data, uh, that, that is a true barrier and we need to work on that. And then we need to see the uh, health economics of, of data sharing. The ambassador pointed that out uh, when, when it comes to uh, really utilizing uh, real-world data, real-world evidence, it's both, of course, about quality, uh, efficiency, and effectiveness in healthcare, but also on showcasing the health economics and the cost around actually u utilizing so. So looking at the barriers is actually a way forward. Thank you. Dr. Fiesta? Thank you. Uh, drawing a little bit upon both interesting comments from Patient Forum and from Elsa Science and from Ole Petter, um, I'm very enthusiastic about the European health data space and it's not always as a ministry official that you're kicking with enthusiasm when new EU regulation is landing <laughs> on your desk. <laughs> but in this case, absolutely. And it's really two parts of it that I specifically would like to underline. And one part is the demand for, for safe uh, data environments to, to be able to use data and to train algorithms or use for research or actually use for policy making as well. And the core idea is really to stop moving data around, you know, let the data be in a, in a safe mm -hmm. uh, environment mm -hmm. and let everyone else mm -hmm. use the data in this environment. And there are a number of, of parts of this that is particularly interesting. I think it will really uh, force the Swedish regions to stop sa saving data in different formats and in different pools and in different, you know, uncomprehensible parts of the system. But we really need to pool the data on a national level for the use for the benefit. And the other part of of uh, European health data space that I really love is, is the patient right aspect. I mean, it's, it's to speak about the right as a patient to access your journal, it's really archaic, you know, it's, it's such so basic. Let's stop about talking about access to your journal. You have to be able to influence your journal or upload data to your journal. And we've been speaking of patient participation or bringing the patients into maker space of co-creation for so long time, but the legal possibilities haven't really been there. Mm. And healthcare has not been ready to, mm. to really you know, welcome patient data. But with the European health data space, it really forces <coughs> healthcare to receive patient data, upload it in you know, relevant formats into your journal which is fantastic, I think, as a patient. You know, you really get into creating your journal. You, you don't only access your journal. Perfect. And with, uh, with the trend of more and more regulations coming from the EU, I like the attitude you have towards <laughs> these regulations. So <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, we will listen to uh, a comment from the audience, and then we'll move on to, to you, Andreas. And then I would like to hear from, from Kais as well. What we are. So please uh, tell us who you are. And, and Great. Uh, Mr. Bastor, esteemed panelists, uh, thanks so much for inviting me. My name is Jing. I'm a researcher at Kalinska Institute and also the Nordic head of rural evidence at Parkcell. And I just wanted to contribute with a story of Swedish-American collaboration uh, in world world evidence. So our research group at KI has been, for the past 20 years, working with data, uh, with blood transfusions, actually blood safety. Uh, and uh, we have now built a database with over 10 million individuals in Sweden and Denmark from the 1960s, including all their blood donations, blood transfusions, EMR data, lab results that we use to study and uh, blood safety. And this project was actually initially funded 20 years ago by the National Institute of Health in the US. 
So as we move on to discuss new alliances, new collaborations between Sweden and the US, I just wanted to give this example because I feel very confident that uh, with this history of 20 years of productive collaborations, at least in the blood safety space, that uh, the future looks very bright. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We, we need all these best practices. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I mean, I just came back from, from the US here and, and uh, our, our small startup that stems from KI works with Vanderbilt in Tennessee, UAB in Alabama, the Dartmouth Institute in Hanover, New Hampshire. I just came back from Columbia University Hospital in, in, in New York. And, our, and we work with, with the bigger children's hospitals here in Sweden, in, in Stockholm, in Lund. And, uh, and th 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 these possibilities exist, right? And, uh, and I w when I left uh, New York, uh, Hussein, who's the head of the Cystic Fibrosis Center there, he gave me this small plate, and it had this statement from, from JFK, and it said, it said, uh, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. And, and I, I think that's our responsibility. The, the people that try, we have to find who they are and we have to support them. And we have to create this culture to, to support people that try and, and really do stuff. And I think that's your, your example from how you said that the KI Core collaboration had been meaningful for you. That was bringing up examples, right? So. So I think, I think uh, we need to hear the, the, these stories and w why I mentioned these institutions in the US in, in, and in Sweden is because I feel that the same conversations are going on. We have the same legislation uh, where patients get more uh, data. We talk about the integration between all these systems. We talk about the languages, the semantics, all of these things. So we should also look across borders and, and help collaborations that like the ones you were mentioning. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, and I turn to you, Kaisa. I hope you can hear well what we're talking about. And uh, I'm a bit curious about when you hear uh, what Sophia say and, and what Maya is saying about uh, patient participatory, trust the data that comes from patients and so on. Um, how are you working with these topics? Well, um, first of all, I'd like to say I very much liked a um, couple of things I heard. So thank you for bringing those points up. I really like the this idea of a uh, balance between safeguards and ethical effective use, because that's precisely what um, our community is thinking. The, the impact of doing nothing is not nothing, and that's sometimes um, forgotten. But at the same time, we want transparency, accountability, and those are very important words. And to know that the safeguards are in place, because that way you will have trust. And without trust, things like the European Health Data Space will simply not work. Um, I also very much like the ownership um, idea. We talk about control, having control over your data. And to remember, it's not just about R&D and new products, important as that is, but it's also about transforming healthcare into a much more participatory process. And um, the, the way we work in EPF on this is obviously we get engaged with the, the European legislation. We propose changes to it. We have been working with our members um, on the proposal um, in the last weeks and months. And we also try to support our national uh, patient organizations to do their advocacy at national level so that we have, in a way, a, a 360 approach, uh, both at the European and at the national level. But also getting into collaborations that don't have to do necessarily, strictly speaking, with the legislation, but more about changing practice. So working also with international organizations like WHO and OECD, but also um, you know, finding partnerships in all sectors um, to look at um, you know, what, does the, what implications are there for healthcare practice, for example, of, of the, the digital transformation um, and how will impact things like shared decision-making uh, and so on. There's such a huge amount of work. I'll just maybe finish this part by saying, maybe in a country like Sweden, it's not so obvious how big a gradient there exists across the EU not just in the terms of the digital capacities of countries, but also in the health literacy of the people, access to digital tools to patients, and a very, very important cultural gradient of patient empowerment and participation. This is a serious 
inequality that we will need to overcome as well. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I was very, very pleased to hear for the first time, I think, uh, in this session, the term inequality. <laughs> um, and uh, I should remind the audience that uh, there are certain challenges when it comes to uh, equity, equality, and access to health. And uh, in our strategy at Karolinska Institute, we say quite simply that we should strive for a better health for all. And all is this magic word that I think should uh, pervade the entire life science sector. So all means that you should work across boundaries, geographical boundaries. We should uh, attend to the dismal situation in part of Africa, for example, which you do. We should, uh, all also means that we should work for the health of future generations, those that are still not born. But the most important thing today, I think, for the entire life science sector is to uh, attend to what we saw during the pandemic, the tremendous inequalities on the global scale when it comes to access to medicines, to diagnostics, to testing, and not least to vaccines. So all is this one word that should drive the life science sector forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sophia? Yes, I would also like to add to what the previous speakers have, have been talking about uh, with the I mean, this space is heavily regulated for all the right reasons. Um, and uh, I would like to stress the fact how difficult and how costly it is to build solutions that people actually want to use, that are usable and user-friendly. It's not only the regulatory work that's extremely time-consuming and um, lots of res resources are necessary and it costs a lot of money. It's also the fact that if you don't build a tool that people love to use and where they see that they get something back, you're rewarded for using it, they will not use it. And you see that about 5% of everything that's being built and released on App Store uh, and Google Play are actually used. So uh, we need a lot of um, uh, resources into this area. It's extremely costly to build these kind of new services and it takes a lot of time. And the healthcare providers, they will not have the time to build these solutions. They, and The patients will not have the time or the money to build the solutions. We need to do this together, collaborate in the whole stakeholder group and, it, and we need investments because um, it takes time. And uh, uh, you need expertise from so many different areas and, and I have sometimes I, I stand in this panel discussion or listen to panels where people believe that you build a, a solution for self-care and self-monitoring with your left hand behind, the your, behind your back. That's, it couldn't be more wrong. Uh, and it's, um, again, it takes time and it's costly for the right reasons many times. Mm, thank you. I would like to turn to you, Ravinder, again. Uh, you see in both the European market and you see in the US market, and you are responsible for this collaboration at, at KI. Uh, first, what is the difference between uh, the two markets? And then, uh, from an uh, industry perspective, uh, what, what do you see uh, as the barrier, or what could be improved in this? Well, when you, when you look at the, the whole data space, for example, in the US, uh, the technology from a technology standpoint is ex exploding, right? There's a new ways of connectivity, new ways of finding to take the different elements of the data and bring it together, then those are the kind of learnings that we can bring um, into the European market from a data standpoint. Uh, <coughs> but in terms of um, sort of connectivity, there are obvious um, some hurdles that we need to overcome over here. And we struggle in, from so many different angles. Uh, there's an enormous amount of data that exists in US that you can get quick access to. It, uh, the data sets that uh, exist in Europe and other markets, uh, the access is rather limited for the obvious reason in some cases. So we need to sort of overcome some of those barriers and how do we provide access <coughs> to the data? And going back to what Dr. Orison was talking about the, the access for all and, and if we want to achieve that sort of goal where you know the innovations and the drugs that come into the marketplace and we provide access to all, we need to overcome some of those barriers and, how do we get access to the data and we can work with those data sets? And that's, that's enormous uh, work that we all need to do collectively. We're looking a lot for best practices. Uh, when you go somewhere else, do you use this as a best practice? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> uh, look, look at our collaboration over here. I mean, this is one of the uh, shiny example, yeah. you know, from best practice standpoint. 
and the collaboration with KI and you know and and uh, with like minds have come together and we found common grounds and we addressing the issues um, from public health and and the common goal of improving patient outcomes so we can find those sort of best practices where collaborations can come together and and, and bring forward all the analytics on that. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to you again, uh, Professor Dillner. Um, from your perspective, working with the industry, uh, what do you see are the benefits and are there some improvements that could be done moving into a new contract with a few five years deal? I, I think it, uh, the, the big benefit uh, from my perspective was just the feeling that working together with, with uh, the industry, we were it was possible to do some good that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just impossible to, to make vaccines on this scale otherwise. So, mm. so for, for me personally, it was mostly a good feeling about it. I, I think that uh, on other things that can be improved, uh, it, it was uh, uh, the point that was, has been raised here that are two of them that, that real world data really should be uh, appreciated by authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, this, uh, this took quite some time, uh, even if we come with data that's just the same as used for medical diagnostics and decide uh, the therapeutic uh, decisions. They, they were still uh, reluctant to accept it at the authorities. I mean, after some time they did, but I recognize this, that. Uh, that there is some resistance to it, which I don't fully understand. When on the balance uh, that uh, uh, Mr. President here talked about on integrity and use, I would like to say that we should listen more to the patients. Uh, whenever we talk to uh, the patients and the participants, they are always extremely anxious on what data, data should be used. So uh, I, I think the patients should have a say in where the balance should be. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Kjastal? I think that there's so many interesting points being raised, but I think the, the issue of inequality is particularly interesting. And, and I think that, at, I mean, there are all these gaps in our access to health. There is mm -hmm. enormous gaps in public health, which really were underlined by the pandemic. But there's also an inequality in how we generate data and and the, you know the higher social standards we have or the higher education or whatever we tend to generate more data and we tend to collect more data and we're really i think in a in a vulnerable position as a society if we're building sort of the new society or the new mm. policy on on data existing we're we're building that information or we're training that algorithms on data generated in an unequal way mm. and how can we really you know, handle that. That's really an issue for democracy and for policy. I mean, policymakers have to acknowledge that we generate data in an unequal way. Mm -hmm. Policymakers have to uh, go in really and, and put a stress on that. And I'm thinking on interesting points also raised by Sophia here that if technology isn't integrated in a social setting or uh, into a cultural setting, technology will not be used. And there's no, uh, you know, sometimes you, you, meet the, the description that, that you know, technological development is bringing us forward and into a glorious future. You know, not, not s by itself, uh, only if we wanted to. And uh, in the same way that technology isn't automatically developed into a user-friendly, interesting, you know, equal uh, force, uh, that is something that has to be actively pursued. So I think that equality is interesting both in the question of data generation, but also into creating technology that is integrated in a social and cultural setting. Yeah, and since this is a kind of topic that's been uh, very high on the agenda for, for the government the last eight years, since 2014, do you see that real-world evidence could be one of those tools to actually reach, reach more uh, equal healthcare? No, definitely. And, and I think that you know, we're looking into a, uh, a development when more and more policy will be based on data, obviously. But that is also, I mean, of course, it's a possibility, but but you know who who writes the algorithms that produce the the policy making in the future? Yeah. Th you know, uh, count me in. That's the most powerful <laughs> job in the government, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and mm -hmm. and that has to be you know someone has. We have to underline that yeah. that power is in technology, sure. and sometimes we underestimate where where power really is. Um. Thank you so much. Uh, I urge you again, please raise your hand or, or just give me a nod somehow if you want the word. And I, I leave the floor to you. Uh, please tell us who you are and, and stay.
state your comment or question. Yes, uh, thank you. So my name is Karin Sundström. I'm also a PI at Karolinska within this framework since uh, several years, and it's been a large pleasure. And this session has really been a vitamin injection <laughs> for a lot of the work, uh, the mm. regulatory. Um, and I guess that just to play the devil's advocate, I would also say that uh, these goals are very real. They are perfectly possible to do, but we also need the human resources and the know-how to do this. And this is something that Dr. Dillner has repeatedly uh, emphasized. And I think we also have some work to do with self-appreciation within both academia and the more traditional sciences, just to make sure that this really disseminates and that we fully explore our human potential to carry out this data. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still uh, large parts of academia who believe that the best evidence comes from animals with four legs rather than two. And mm -hmm. I think whereas that can be very true <laughs> in some areas, well, zebra fish don't have any legs at all, uh, <laughs> or banana flies. Um, I need to feel sometimes that, well, I work with humans, and that is also okay. And then we also <laughs> are at that side, the randomized trials area. And that's also valuable. So thank you for, for this type of work. It uh, reinsures us for the future. Thank you. Thanks for the comment then. So. Uh, I'll try to pick a question there as well for the for the panel. Uh, and so, why is utilization of health data and real world data to real world evidence more important, or how does it improve the, the random clinical trials? Then, anyone wants to elaborate? I see that you're already thinking. <laughs> uh, we, well, uh, the uh, uh, a major improvement of the real world evidence is uh, that it's really comprehensive for the entire population. Uh, whenever you have a randomized clinical trial, it's always a uh, selected subgroup that may differ from the rest of the population in socioeconomics or health or other things. And with the uh, real world data, when it's population based, you can really see uh, the effectiveness on the entire population in a way that a randomized clinical trial cannot do. I mean, they, uh, an RCT also has advantages, of course, in minimizing biases, but it, it uh, needs to be complemented with population-based real-world data, I think. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Andreas, San Ole Petter, uh, and then uh, Jenny. Yeah, um, I, uh, to me, uh, in, in situations where, where we have been part of uh, real-world data projects, there is, a, there is another opportunity that, that arises, which is uh, we're able to work on quality improvement issues of healthcare. We can start w talking about the care plans that will be implemented with the new change from, from the start. We can talk about, the when we talk about the infra infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, we talk about the infrastructure that is actually going to be used with the patients in the future. So, so, so you have the quality improvement part, you have the IT part, and then you have the research part, where it's also you're you're challenging uh, the, the the current uh, models of of uh, carrying out healthcare, and you're you're discussing how can we do this now in a way to generate evidence, and how can we continuously uh, generate evidence uh, in the future. So, I think th this is a it's huge, and it, it was is is often a shock when when you leave the RCT space. The RCT space is is huge too, but this is a different huge, <laughs> uh, which new 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 huges are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's always a spectrum of huges. Thank yeah. you, uh, Ole Petter and then Jenny, and then we'll have a question from the audience. Yes, uh, f first a comment uh, on the number of legs. Um, <laughs> and I completely agree. I mean, uh, we have to understand that uh, data from uh, the human species with two legs are extremely important. And I think, I dare say, that uh, KI is uh, taking steps to ensure that we have access to data, that we can employ data uh, for the benefit of our patients. So uh, we have new organizational structures also in place to attend to humans and uh, animals with two legs. So that's a very important issue. But I would like to follow up, if I may, this question about RCTs uh, in relation to uh, real-world data. And I think uh, the pandemic has told us that there is another dimension to this, and this is a time perspective. I mean, uh, when a crisis hits, and there will be a new crisis, we have to be agile. We have to work on a short-term perspective 
which does not, of course, allow for, for, for RCTs, that, but that depends on the access to real-world data. So the time perspective here is very, very important, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Janne? Yes, I, I would like to uh, actually pick on that because the the, uh, the learnings that we have from from the pandemic that it was really a data driven decision making, uh, real time, uh, not only real world and real data. It was real time data driven decision making. So that's one aspect why this is important on on population health. And the other aspect is of course when we're moving towards precision medicine and n equals one, then it's a totally new paradigm. And then I would like to turn to the appreciation because one of the appreciations that I really have of the Swedish ecosystem, a true stronghold, are our super perfect governmental agencies. They're really in the forefront of uh, implementing the you new uh, regulatory framework. And I always like it when I come to uh, a meeting like this and we uh, actually have four of the agencies in the room. They're really in the four forefront of this development. And I think that that will also be a stronghold for Sweden uh, going forward. And I would like to see more inclusions of the uh, regulatory research also in collaborations like the one between KI and MSD, because we're moving towards uh, a new era where we also need to work with the new regulatory issues at the same time. Thank you. Please tell us who you are and then state your comment or question. Thank you, Michel Silvestri, eHealthsmyndigheten, Swedish eHealth agency, and actually uh, I myself and my agency are working hands-on uh, regarding building the European health data space and, and also national data space would be a good thing uh, to connect <laughs> to the European one, right? Uh, and also, uh, speaking of that, uh, on the Nordic level, we also have a Nordic vision for this, uh, the Nordic health data commons. Um, but when we have this perfect mix of, of the key stakeholders uh, when it comes to, to these issues. Uh, my question is, how, if you would like to comment at least or, or, or uh, elaborate a bit when it comes to uh, uh, achieving a good business model for the health data spaces. Uh, would, would you have any opinions about that? Uh, how to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, to achieve a, a fair and just kind of business model for this on a European level and or a national level? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. And uh, I see that since you already wanted to, to yeah. comment something, the can we incentivize or can we build a business model around data? Uh, absolutely. And um, I mean, now I am forced to launch my service in the United States because we do not have any reimbursement models in Europe uh, or Sweden for what we're doing. But in order to strike a deal with a payer in the United States, a value-based payment model, which means that we are proving uh, that costs are going down and have a model around cost savings sharings with the American payers. We need the outcomes from our service and those can come from studies, they can come from clinical trials, but they definitely also come from the patient reported outcomes. So we are forced mm -hmm. to work with data, prove uh, from a health economic perspective that we have a value in order to have a business model and a deal with the payers in the United States. Uh, so it, it's, it's simple, it's a simple business model, it's very difficult to get there. Thank you. And before I leave the word to, to you, Marcus, uh, I'm preparing you, Kaisa, because I would like to, to have a few words from you again um, sur surrounding uh, policy making on the European level and what we can expect in the future uh, if you're successful with your lobbying and, and policy work. So, But first, please uh, tell us who you are and, and your comment or question. Yes, Marcus Lingmer, I'm working a lot on national level with uh, information driven uh, healthcare. Uh, I would just like to stress one thing, uh, knowing that we are all prone to love these uh, uh, organizational collaborations across industries, uh, I'm from the public sector and the academic sector, what we need to, to focus even more on is the fragility of these collaborations because even when contracts are in place and money is in place and, and people uh, like uh, us in this room who are, who are involved are in place, we, can, we are still judged by uh, the public eventually. Even when we follow every rule in the book, uh, we are judged by the public. And when we make long-term investment, engagements in, in these kinds of collaborations, 10-year ones uh, like the, these, they can be ruined by bad rep rep reputation. And I would like to increase the 
like public discourse on this, being actually uh, trusted when I reach out to MSD or whatever uh, to, to increase collaboration because we really need each other and not having to um, be afraid that down, further down the line the reputation of this wonderful engagement will be ruined by, by a mal discourse, so to speak. Thank you. It's a good point. Thank you. Um, Kaisa, did you, did you reckon what I asked you prior to, to Marcus' comment? <laughs> well, um, I think you asked me about the European health data space, but actually That's what good. we're... Thinking Let's about. go into that then, yeah. So what, what can we expect? Uh, I'm not sure I can tell you what you can expect, but <laughs> what, <laughs> what we as an organization representing the interest of patients would like to see would be uh, a framework that... Um, gives truly the, the power to the people to control their data and to benefit from it and, and its use. So there, there are so many aspects um, to this that I, I can't cover them all in detail, but obviously, and obviously this is a very complex framework that has this aspect of intermingling national and European uh, competencies, um, also national frameworks to fit within the European one and vice versa. Um, so one is the empowerment aspect. Uh, second would be the the right balance between between the safeguards and the enablers. Um, participatory governance. I think we don't maybe talk about governance quite enough, but um, from our perspective, patients' participation in governance will be very critical, not only to find the right balances in, in various aspects, but to ensure links to the community and to ensure trust. Obviously, at European level, there will be a governing body where we'd like to see civil society represented, but also at the national level. The European uh, legislation is also an opportunity for us to bring attention to issues that are not necessarily solved in the legal text um, adopted, but you know, to, to kind of encourage national um, policies and member states to take action. And one of the, the barriers I see, and, and I hope we can also draw attention to that, is patient and public participation, frankly. And I mean, I mentioned governance, but just from a practical perspective, as others have said, in the development of the solutions, in the shaping of national frameworks and tools as well. And the, the eternal barrier here is, from our perspective, resourcing um, it because patient and public participation is often seen still as a nice to have element and not given the recognition of its fundamental importance. And the other is changing the culture of it because there is still um, far too much paternalism in medical culture. And not in the, uh, the you know, this country um, is not, um, is a front runner, I would say, but you know, we will remember and we have to remember that what we want to do is equalize and bring up those parts of Europe that are not there yet. So uh, just to finish, we in EPF are also looking at the how to. So for those who really want to commit to patient engagement and public engagement, we are looking at the, the best ways to do it. And there's not one single solution for that, but there's a lot that exists that can be used. Thank you very much. Jani? I think that that is so essential that we uh, are able really to include the patient perspective from the strategic top level. And that is truly difficult, but that's something that we need to be, that's need to be done in our governance structure because the, we lack trust when we don't feel that there is clear governance. And that is also a way going forward in actually building trust for the future. Coming back to what uh, Professor uh, Lingman said about accountability and responsibility. When you're working, you're responsible for what you do, but it must be clear that when you're in this space, uh, someone will t actually take the account, be accountable for what is done. Uh, because otherwise, if that is sort of down to the, the, to the initial, to, to the one-on-one -on -one collaboration, or if that is down to a, sp a specific person, it becomes so very fragile. If we want to build sort of a larger space, we need to have a clear accountability governance structure. And we, I, my view is really that we build that from having a strategic inclusion from the patient perspective from the top. Now, how that is orchestrated, uh, is I think it will be important for the future. It will be important for the European health data space, which I also think that 
that's, that's a huge, it's a huge vehicle, but it's imp an important vehicle for our development. Thank you very much. And in the interest of time, before we wrap up, a very short comment from you, and then I will turn to you, Maya. Uh, I will not give you a heads up, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> please. <laughs> yes, uh, very briefly. Um, this is a fascinating discussion, but it's uh, really very much focused on the Western world or the global north, as it were. So there is another paper coming up from uh, Brussels, and that is the European Global Health Approach. And this will be a paper coming up uh, in uh, October, I think it is. And I do hope, I really do hope, that uh, when we talk about real world data, we reflect on what is the world here. The world is the global arena. So I think again that we should be very, very insistent on carrying this discussion with the global perspective in mind. And uh, talking about vaccines, we as a global community, we don't really learn from our mistakes. What happened during the pandemic? Well, in e unequal distribution of vaccines, certainly, that's an understatement. And what is happening now with the monkeypox vaccines? We see again that we are not able to apply the global perspective to what we do, even though we use terms like real world data. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that actually relates to, to my question, both uh, when we hear from the United States, we hear from the European Union, we talk about the world. How much are we in the driver's seat of our future, Maya? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the right person. <laughs> oh, okay. Batteries are out. Uh, not sure. Well, I, I'm not in the driver's seat. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but uh, I'm. You I have I two th weeks, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, I, c I can do a lot in two weeks. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think we're very much in the driving seat, actually, in Sweden for for several reasons. And one is, you know, that we're really a, a role model in registra registries, uh, and I think we're really a, a driving force in the European Union. And I think if if I if I'm allowed to be particular, I think that our uh, part in the European health data space will be really instrumental. And, and just to comment on, on Michael from the eHealth agency uh, posing the question, like how will we construct the national data space? And you know, I'm leaving office so I can say what I like now. <laughs> and uh, I, I would say it has to be state owned. Uh, it has to be uh, constructed with legislation. No more voluntarily co collaboration, cooperation, no. It has to be owned by state agency. And I think that we, dare to st we need to dare to say that because there's really a risk that we're constructing mm -hmm. another you know, cooperation that's, that's a bit loosey-goosey. Uh, I think that to really um, harvest uh, all of the benefits from European health data space, we have to construct a national data space uh, that is state-owned. Thank you. <laughs> That's the next seminar then. <laughs> so with that, uh, we're very thank thankful for the hospitality of, of your ambassador. We're, we're thankful for the speakers and uh, the panelists. And we have a very competent audience and very competent people also on the broadcast. And thank you, Kaisa, for your, your engagement in this, being able to, be, uh, to participate online. With that, a warm applause to everybody. Thank you. <laughs>